have today. Today, we're worshiping, worshiping creation. We're worshiping the environment. It's the first thing that God takes from man is, is that, is the environment. You don't worship that. I'm in control of it. All right? And so, so this is what we have to understand about, about what's going on and why God begins with the trees and the grass and he eventually steps it up to man himself. So what I'm going to do now is on your sheets here, and I have this on your sheets, on uh, page uh, 34, what was that? No, page, uh, yeah, page number 33. Uh, I want to do an overview now of Revelation. Uh, and then we're going to look at some charts here. Now, Revelation chapter 8 to 9 introduces the first six trumpet judgments, right? For the first six years of the tribulation. Each trumpet represents a year. Chapter 10 introduces another mighty angel, uh, like we saw in chapters 8, uh, 1 to 3, prior to the next phase of God's judgment, because in 921, man is still not repented. We see that at the end of, look at chapter 9. In verse 21. So here's the, here's the six trumpet judges, right? And here's God's analysis. Okay, what's the impact of our bombing campaign? They're still not surrendering. This is a military action. It's the Lord of hosts. It, it's a judgment. And what, okay, where's man's heart now? <clears throat> well, according to verse 21, neither repented they of their murders, or sorceries, their fornications or their thefts. <clears throat> People won't get it yet. So, <clears throat> why is this necessary? <clears throat> Do we need to sound the seventh trumpet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the mighty angel that we're going to see in Revelation chapter 10, let's look at there now and read that, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven and clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head. Remember Revelation chapter 4 and 5? And his face was as the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Remember Revelation chapter 1 and 2, all right? Concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, the scripture there. And he had in his hand a little book. Thank you. And he had in his hand a little book. Uh, and in his right hand, his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth. And he cried with loud voices with a lion, roared. And when he had cried with the seven thumbs, uttered her voice. Now, you look at that description. You look at that description and you wonder, let me just see here, I went backwards. Who else could it be but the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, I, I, everything that's in there fits descriptions earlier of Jesus Christ. Uh, who took the book from the Father's right hand? Jesus Christ. Uh, who uh, is described as having feet in the fiery furnace? Jesus Christ. So it is definitely the Lord Jesus Christ. The angel of the Lord, if you will, is, is who this is. The mighty angel is the, is the Lord Jesus Christ himself who has his book and he's coming down and he's speaking to John. He's going to be speaking to John and John hears these seven thunders utter, utter their voices. And it's very intriguing here because uh, what remains now is just a little book because all that remains now is the seventh trumpet and the seven last plagues. It's the final chapter for the history of the earth in the times of the Gentiles is what it is. It's the end of Babylon is what it's going to be. Uh, chapters 11 to 14, we're going to go back and look at some, some of these other things. But chapters 11 to 14 are parenthetical chapters that go back and review uh, the events that have taken place. Chapters 15, we will see a heavenly preparation for the final seven judgments and the final harvesting. And chapter 16 is the final judgment of the seventh year. And literally in chapter 16, the seventh angel sounds his trumpet and pours out the seven last plagues. That is Revelation chapter 16. Now what's interesting here, in, in basically three chapters, or actually just two, <coughs> chapters uh, 8 and chapter 16, you have the trumpet judgments being poured out. In chapter 8, we have all the trumpet judgments, 1 through 6, and in, uh, I'm sorry, chapters 8 through 9, trumpet judgments, 1 through 6, and then in chapter 16, you have the seventh trumpet and the seven flags. And then what follows that, 17 and 18, is again another parenthetical section which looks at the details 
of those plagues on the, the harlot woman, on Babylon and the fall of Babylon and all that. And in chapter 19, you'll see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, 1718, the destruction of Bab Babylon in review. Chapter 19, the marriage feast of the Lamb. It should be Lamb, they're not Lamb. And the return of Christ. In chapter 20, the personal judgment of the devil and the lost uh, the lost and the thousand year reign of Christ. All right? This is what we're going to see in chapter 20. In 21, the new heavens, the new earth, and the eternal state is what takes place. So that is kind of the layout of what happens in Revelation chapter 21. Uh, and so what's interesting is you look at the book of Revelation and you try to understand the seven years, and quite honestly, two chapters. Chapters 8, well, three chapters, 8 and 9, and chapter 16. That's it. That is the seven years, and everything else is detail. It's detail about it. And so you have to understand how they, they plug into there. All right, we'll look at that. And finally, chapter 22 is conclusion and warnings. So let's look at this chart. I put these charts in here just to kind of refresh us at this point. So we did this overview. So here they are. There's the seven trumpets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And notice five, six, and seven are the woes. Here's the middle of the tribulation period, right here in the middle. And so, so, so trumpet one sounds, one year, trumpet two sounds, that's the beginning of the second year. And at the end of the second year, the third trumpet sounds, at the end of the third year, the fourth trumpet sounds, so forth, until you get to the seventh trumpet. So at the end of the sixth year, the seventh trumpet is sounded, and this time is going to be cut short. And the Lord, it's cut short with the Lord's return because if he doesn't return, no flesh will be saved. All right? And so that's why the return of Christ is here. So this is the day of the Lord uh, that the book of Revelation talks about. And after all that, the thousand-year reign of Christ and the final destruction of Gog and Magog at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. So that's kind of the overview. Any questions on that? Okay? At the top of here, we see the 69 weeks plus one week equals 70. That's from the book of Daniel. Daniel gives us a 70 weeks prophecy. 69 weeks were fulfilled when Christ was crucified. There's one week remaining. That is what's coming. Right? And the first 69 weeks focused in on Israel. So does the last week. All right. That's why Israel had to become a nation again. And the final battle destruction of God and Magog, that's the, the battle of Armageddon, correct? Uh, no, the yeah. battle of Armageddon is going to take place here when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, because okay. what's happening is Antichrist mm -hmm. is coming to power, and so you have the Middle East rule and reign there, you have the kings of the East coming down, and you have the West, the remnants of the West coming against Antichrist. And then they all gather in the Valley of Jezreel, and so all the armies of the world are gathering together and God's going to destroy them all at the brightness of his coming. And then that's when you're going to beat the plowshares or the, the swords and the plowshares and stuff that we war no more. God's going to destroy them. That's the battle of Armageddon. See, the battle of Gog and Magog, there's, there's actually three major battles. There's the battle of Gog and Magog with the opening of the sixth seal that, we're, that the world is going to see, I believe, fairly soon, uh, where Israel's threatened. God supernaturally delivers them. The church is raptured. And we go through the seven years of tribulation. At the end of the seven years of tribulation, you have another battle, which is the battle of Armageddon, which is all the armies of the world, uh, and God's going to destroy those. Does that mean when the, Now, one of those battles, isn't that going to be the temple going to be rebuilt? Yes, at the end... Going to be yeah. Now, think of, just think about it for, for a minute. Think about the sequence. Here we are right now. Israel's becoming a nation again, right? It is a nation. Mm -hmm. What do they want to do? Rebuild the temple. They want to rebuild the temple. What's preventing them from rebuilding the temple? Yeah, um, the the rock, the the rock, the rock, the right. Okay. So, so there's a battle coming, <coughs> and God's going to win that battle. The Jews are going to be delivered, and at the end of that battle, the world is going to the world is going to realize that it's God's judgment. So, in the midst of that, so in, at the end of that battle, there's a peace treaty made. At the end of a war, isn't that usually what they do? They make a peace treaty. The, let's just say the 12th Imam arrives. 
And he says, well, we've got to make a peace treaty with Israel. And part of that peace covenant is, let's let them rebuild the temple. That's what's going to happen. See, that's going to be the sign of, of this peace treaty. They're going to let the Jews rebuild the temple. But in the middle of that, that treaty, the Antichrist is going to defile the temple. He's going to reveal himself as God standing in the temple. He's going to kill the two witnesses. And that's when, that's when war breaks out again against the Jews. The Jews flee into the world in this court in Revelation chapter 12. And the armies of the world, everything is now ignited. And it's going to end with all these armies from the east and from the west coming in against the, the Antichrist. Let's just say it's an Islamic imam. Uh, the Islamic world. So all this is going to do battle in the Valley of Jezreel. For what? For Israel the prize? Maybe it's for the oil, the gas, the control. It's just for survival is what it is. But isn't that Arab tradition? They always make a peace treaty. Absolutely. Then they break it. That's right. It's right away. That's right. In the middle of. Or... Right. That's exactly right. When you think it's to your convenience, it's yeah. exactly what it is. There's a word for, for it. I forget the name of it. But while it's Shubat, uh, we went to see him down in Dallas, brought that point up, that he, that's why he, he does believe that the Antichrist is, Islam, is Islamic, uh, or a, a, a Jewish Islamic or Muslim descent, uh, and he's the one that can bring peace. Uh, just imagine the Imam coming forth after the Battle of Gog and Magog, and by the way, what does Ahmadinejad believe, that the Imam's going to appear after a great battle? <coughs> right. It's all fitting together. Yeah, so, so this battle of Gog and Magog that the stage is being set for, the world is going to think they have survived Armageddon. Yeah. They're going to think that because they don't know what's coming in. And they're going to be on the brink of it, the brink of the seven years of tribulation. And it won't be to the middle of the tribulation period when the Antichrist defiles the temple. That's why in Matthew it says, let him that read it understand. When you see the abomination of desolation yeah, yeah. that's spoken by the prophet Daniel, you know that you're that the it's not agree to rebuild the temple. The Arabs even agree yes. to rebuild the temple. Yes, that's right. Because he's got to have some place to sit. And it's going to take the supernatural deliverance of Israel to convince them that God is mad, God is angry, and they're going to do it. <laughs> so the Jews will be pushed out of Israel one more time then. No, they won't be pushed out. The attempt will be made to push them out, but God will deliver them. God will supernaturally deliver them. They will not succeed. Zechariah chapter 12, Zechariah chapter 14, no. Because some not preachers succeed. on TV are preaching that the Jews have to lose Israel one more time. No. Not really. Well, it may appear that way after the battle of Gog and Magog because it will be like a, a Gentile rule in there, but it's not going to last. It's not going to last. And see, what's going to happen at that point? is the two witnesses are going to appear on the scene, and they are going to be a thorn in the side. All right, you think Glenn Beck is bad? Well, these two guys get going, all right? So they'll be a thorn in their side. That's why they're killed. And they're going to be blamed for the fire coming down from heaven. And by the way, isn't that what they do? They have the power of Moses. They can drive the water, and they can call down fire from heaven. And that's what the trumpet judgments are, so they're going to blame them. Isn't that interesting? You know, what's going on in Washington? What's the big deal? Who can, who's going to get blamed for it? That's what everybody's playing. Everybody's playing the blame game. Right? And the collapse is coming. And it, but all, all, everybody's concerned about, hey, I don't want to get blamed for it. You know? It's like, hey, it's God's doing. Uh, yeah. So, uh, okay, that's, that's the overview that we're looking at. Now, let's look at Revelation chapter 9 in a little bit more detail here. So, again, with the sounding of the trumpet, uh, we see Satan cast out of heaven. Let's go back to chapter 9. The fifth angel sounded, and the star fell from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Right? And so, notice a star fell from heaven, and to him was given a key. So what does that tell you? The star is not a star. A star is an angel, a fallen angel. Didn't Jesus Christ say, I see Satan falling as a star? Right? And what is he seeing? He's seeing this event. He's seeing the downfall. He's, he prophesied the downfall of casting out of Satan from heaven is what he, was what he prophesied. So Satan is cast out of heaven, and the battle takes place. We see the detail of that 
in Revelation chapter 12. He has the keys to the bottomless pit to release the demons on earth. And there's a description there in chapter 9 that the face of locusts and long hair are ugly. They're, they're like, maybe it's E.T. So, what is that? Well, it's, it's demonic. Oh. It's demonic. You know, they have the face of a locust, the face of a grasshopper. What does E.T. look like? The big eyes? It almost looks like a grasshopper. You know, so maybe the world was being set up to accept demons as just extraterrestrials. Mm -hmm. okay. Who knows? I, I, I don't want to be here. This indicates that the trumpet judgments are over, well, it says here in verse 10, they were to hurt men five months, which is, to me is very interesting because it tells us, it shows us here a duration period. And that duration period more, more likely is five months after the sounding of the, the, uh, the fifth trumpet. All right, because it is a woe. And but what the point I'm simply trying to make here is that you're, it's a time period. I'm saying each trumpet judgment is a year, and this is pointing to well, it's at least five months. Five months going on here. So uh, so as we look at these judgments, we're just given a summary of what they are. But the campaign is lasting for a whole year. Right. So it's like the trumpet is sound. I'll give you a year to respond uh, to what's happening. And then finally, it, we notice that it's the first woe, and because it says the last verse there, the first woe is past, and two more are yet to come. Then we, again, we get to Revelation chapter 10. It's a break in the progression before the final fall of judgment of the seventh trumpet. Our Bible is in Revelation chapter 10, and this is a, you know, we had a, our discussion, you know, prior to getting back into the study about the angels and stars, and you're going to see Revelation chapter 10 here, the mighty angel. Uh, as the Lord Jesus Christ. But in Revelation chapter 10, now after chapter 9, after the sixth trumpet is, is pronounced as, as being sounded, uh, we're going to see here there's a break in the action. And the break in the action is to give us some more information, some detail of the things that have already happened. And so the angel of the Lord, which is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, comes. We've read that passage already. And we see this break in the action. The mighty angel with the little book in his hand. Uh, it, this must be the Lord Jesus himself, which is the angel of the Lord. All right? uh, in the Old Testament, you'll see uh, Jacob. Uh, he's wrestling with the angel of the Lord. All right? Who is that? Well, I believe the angel of the Lord there is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Uh, the priesthood of Melchizedek. Who is that? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's, it's an appearance of Jesus Christ. He's... He, you know, he's from the beginning and the end. He's always existed, and so this is just a manifestation of him. So as you look at the description, though, there uh, that, that we've read already of this, this individual with the rainbow and the cloud and all that, I want us to go to Daniel chapter 12, verses 5 to 9, and we'll look at that. And note that in both, both cases, time will be no more and the prophecy will have been completed. Uh, in both of these passages. And then in the end of Revelation chapter 10, John must see the prophecy again. We're going to go back to those. Uh, Is it Daniel 9? Okay. 12, 12, 12, 12. 9. Daniel 12. Yeah, Daniel 12, verses 5 to 9. But as we look at the uh, this passage, which looks really interesting about it, uh, of course, it's the last chapter in the book of Daniel, and Daniel is the skeleton, if you would, and Revelation is the glove that fits the skeletal hand of prophecy in the book of Daniel. And it's starting in verse, verse number 5, it says, Daniel, and I, Daniel, looked, behold, there stood other two, one on the side of the bank and the river on the, on the other side of the bank of the river, there's these two angels. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river. And then when he held up his right hand, his left hand to heaven, just like in Revelation chapter 10, all right, that live it forever, that it shall be for times and times and a half a time. A time and times, that's three years and a half, it's a half a year. So it's a three and a half year period here, all right? Uh, and it says, and, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the Holy people and all these things shall be finished and I heard but I understood not said oh my lord what shall be the end of these things and he said go thy way Daniel for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end and so a key to understanding the prophecy is the time for which it speaks 
which I believe is our day. So in other words, when he said it wasn't now, but it's now that that we we can see yeah. the concept. Yeah, that. so much has happened. I mean, we're looking at over almost 3,000 years of history here, yeah. from when that prophecy took place to what is right now. <laughs> and what basically Jesus is telling him is that the time of the end, for which they're meant, they will speak. All right? And there's an interesting, in, in Isaiah, there's a passage that talks about how the Word of God will meet its mate, and that what God has spoken will meet its mate in time, that it will be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, God's Word is not without its mate. It will you know, find its fulfillment in, the, in history. Mm -hmm. so, so this particular passage, which is interesting, though, is this is what's called, in Revelation uh, chapter 10, you see the same thing, one standing, one foot on the earth, and one foot on the river, and it's a cosmic Christ, it's a picture of, uh, get this, this is Christ standing up, and what John is seeing, he's seeing the cosmic Christ, and quite honestly, if you want a representation of this in the cosmos, the Orion, the constellation Orion, with its one hand lifted up to heaven, alright, and I believe what Orion has in his hand is not a sword, the scroll, the scroll of God. Mm -hmm. All right, and that's what this picture here is. We have a cosmic rep representation, and, and if you look at Orion, Orion appears at one time to have his foot on the river Orendus, which is another constellation uh, in in the in the cosmos, and one foot on the earth. And the picture here that's being painted is that the Lord Jesus Christ has everything under His feet. Mm -hmm. It's the cosmos mm -hmm. and the earth are under His feet. Psalms one ten. Is a very interesting psalm because it says concerning Jesus Christ, sit thou here at my right hand till I put all things under thy feet. That's what's taking place. All right. So this cosmic angel that John sees in Revelation chapter 10 is the Lord Jesus Christ in representation of him who lifts up his hand to the Father and swears by him that sits upon the throne. So the veracity of what he's about to say is, is so significant. But it's God is putting all things under his feet. That's what he's done with the first six trumpet judgments. He's bringing the world under his feet. And the final trumpet is yet to sound, and which contains the seven plagues, when indeed all things will finally be under his feet. All right? So that's the picture of what's going on here. And everybody says, well, what did the seven thunders utter? I don't know. But when the seventh angel utters his voice, and then it's all, then the prophecy is complete, it's fulfilled, it is done. And so there's nothing else to be fulfilled once the seventh angel sounds. But he tells them not to, to seal up what the seven thunders uttered. They weren't for us to know. But they do concern a uh, prophecy that when the voices sound, time will be no more. There is no more time left. It's fulfilled. All right? And so that's what's significant about, about John's prophecy. And, and as you look, let's go back to Revelation chapter 10, and you notice here, as we read Revelation chapter 10, uh, let's just go back and look at that. Uh, let's pick it up from verse number, number 4. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write and I heard the voice of him in heaven saying to me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea, see it? And upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things that are therein, for therein, and that they should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God, shall be finished, as he had declared to his servants and prophets. So that's making reference back to Daniel. The prophecy that God has foretold, not just Daniel, but all the prophets. God has foretold the prophets as things that were going to be done. <clears throat> and with these seven angels sounding, it's complete. It's finished. Everything is going to be accomplished. You know, so the question that you have then is, well, when? And maybe what the seven angels uttered, uttered something that would maybe reveal something in that aspect. I, I don't know. I'm only speculating. The point of it is there was something there that God didn't want revealed at that particular time. He wanted it kept secret. Uh, so I, I don't know. It could be anything. You know, but it's just a speculation. So we'll find out in the end. Right? Well, to mm -hmm. say if, yeah. if we knew what the seventh angel was going to say, then we would possibly know the time and the hour. 
Well, we know what he's going to say and do because he tells us later on. Well, we don't know when. I don't know what he uttered there. Right. No one knows because it's right. not written. Right. Right? It's sealed up. Uh, but it is sealed. But someday it will be revealed. Right? And so maybe that's one of the first questions I'll have for the Lord. <laughs> so I'll probably know by then. Yeah. Okay. And so he goes on in verse number 8 then. He says, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go, take the little book. So he's got the remainder of the book. Take the little book, which is open in thy hand, of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. It shall make thy belly bitter, but in thy mouth it shall be sweet as honey. And he took the little book out of the angel in the hand and ate it up. And it was in his mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as he had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. A very interesting passage there. John must prophesy again. And the question I have there, is he going to be one of the two witnesses? Mm. You know, is, is it going to be John? Because remember, John the Baptist. Yeah. Who was John the Baptist? Mm -hmm. He was there in the spirit of Elijah. Yeah. You know? And and so, so it, you kind of see this idea that Elijah, the spirit that was in Elijah, the spirit that was in John the Baptist, the spirit that was in Moses, these two lampstands in Zechariah, uh, these are two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And these are like these, and these lampstands are the prophets. It's the spirit of the prophets. And these spirits indwell the prophets and enlighten and loom and give them power to prophesy on earth. Whether it be Ezekiel, whether it be uh, uh, Elijah, Elisha, John the Baptist, or, or another John, another John someday, will come and prophesy and these things will come forth. Uh, so I don't know, I'm only speculating here. But don't get don't get wrapped up in it's gotta be Ezekiel and it's gotta be or uh, uh, Elijah and it's gotta be Moses. No. It's not Moses who was doing those things. It's the spirit that was in Moses. It was the spirit that was in Elijah. It was the spirit that was in John the Baptist. And so that's that's who's coming. Alright? Is the spirit of Elijah and the spirit of Moses. Right, right. The sealing book. Yeah. I really didn't notice that yeah. before yeah. Um, the books that were found. Yeah. There's one that's left that's yep. bound. Mm -hmm. That's what I was bringing up that day. Right. right. Yeah. There's, I just didn't relate it to that. Yeah. See, it, it's, it's just one more. Uh, and so it's the one that's sealed. So, so John must prophesy again. And let me submit to you, isn't he doing that right now? You know, through through this vessel, yes. but through everyone who goes out and preaches, John is prophesying again, you know, to another generation. And he's speaking especially to the generation whom it was meant for, which I believe is this generation. Right? So uh, I'm not John. I'm, I'm John Abed. <laughs> So don't, don't mistake him what I'm saying. God, the spirit of right. Can we right. right in you as well as anybody Amen. else? Amen. Well, so, so that's Revelation chapter 10. So we're beginning this parenthetical section here. So now we get to see some more of the characters, okay? Uh, the, the gaps are being filled in. So we get to Revelation chapter 11, and what do we read? We read, and there was given to me a reed until like a rod, and the angel stood <clears throat> saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. And the altar did that worship therein. So he's given a reed to measure the temple at this particular time. Now, here's what you have to understand. What was the book of Revelation? Anybody know? 